The ship is called Eye of the Wind. Her voyage is part of an extraordinary adventure involving 2,000 men and women from many different countries, many of whom sailed aboard her. For two years, Eye of the Wind circumnavigated the globe, taking young explorers to some of the wildest places on Earth giving them the chance to experience the adventure of a lifetime and afterwards inspire others with the same pioneer spirit. They made new discoveries. They often faced danger. They saw sights witnessed by few modern men. Their adventure was codenamed Operation Drake. How do you pick the right teams for such an adventure? 58,000 candidates between the ages of 17 and 24 applied. Individual testing took place around the world and 414 were finally selected. There were tests designed to find out how candidates would stand up to physical stress as a group or as individuals. Among those selected was a young woman from Edmonton, Canada. Despite the fact that she'd lost her right leg from cancer, Anna Richards showed the will and the courage to meet the challenge. That I wasn't going to be restricted by a few nuts and bolts. It's given me a determination to follow my dreams and not my disabilities. Blessed be the ship. God the Father bless her. Drake's prayer continues with those immortal words. It is not the beginning, but the continuing of the same until it be thoroughly finished that yieldeth the true glory. I'm John Blashford Snell, a colonel in the Royal Engineers and director of the operation named after the voyage of Sir Francis Drake, the first Englishman to circle the globe. In the winter of 1577, Drake and his crew left Plymouth and returned three years later. Now, in October 1978, four centuries later, the first phase of Operation Drake will cross the Atlantic to the Caribbean and Panama. Just as Drake did, the 150-ton brigantine, Eye of the Wind, sails from Plymouth. Prince Charles, patron of Operation Drake, attends its official launching. 24 young explorers sail with her on the first phase of the operation. There will be 10 phases altogether during the ship's two-year circumnavigation, each one operated by different groups. The first 24 now face a journey on the high seas, as well as a new testing of themselves in strange lands and difficult terrain. I am particularly glad so many young people are able to take part in this particular operation. I think that opportunities for adventure and for achievement are very limited nowadays for the younger person. Anyway, I sincerely hope that this expedition will contribute a great deal to uh, scientific research in particular and to uh, the countries that the expedition visits and also to the young people themselves. Hip, hip, hip. of the wind sails on the 22nd of October 1978. She leaves the dockside at Plymouth and moves out of the harbour, accompanied by dozens of small boats. The 132-foot square rigger, equipped with a full scientific laboratory, will soon be on her own, crossing the ocean for 23 days, on the way to some of the most challenging tropical regions of the world. Prince Charles will leave when she reaches the open sea, but for the moment he is at the helm. And got a lot of metal there, yeah. And uh, she's a sound ship, although she's, you know, built in 1911, but she is a sound ship. In addition to carrying out marine biological work, Eye of the Wind will support land-based teams of scientists and servicemen 
as they make extended stopovers for research and exploration. The voyage begins. For the young crew, it's a fairly shattering leap from a familiar world to a totally strange and often intimidating one. There's no time for a leisurely education. There was a hell of a lot to do on maintaining a boat. The first thing in the morning that's done is scrub all the decks. I guess we just accepted it because these jobs have got to be done. Climbing up the uh, rattlings is it's quite scary at times because when the ship lurches, if it lurches to the side that you're on, on the rattlings, then you feel as you're going to fall off any minute. And there's been a couple of times when I thought I was really going to fall off. And not many people have experienced that. Central stirrup, you see the stirrup coming down under the foot rope? Scorch past that. One of the key aspects of the voyage is learning to share the responsibility for each other's well-being and even survival. Soon there comes a chance for the crew to prove themselves. The North Atlantic is never friendly for very long. The glass is falling and a storm is building fast. In the teeth of a force eight gale, the ship is barely able to make headway. The Atlantic suddenly seems to be twice as wide. I just recovered from seasickness when we really hit the force eight gale. The only time I was frightened was when I went to take the wheel. I was trying and I just couldn't do it, and it really frightened me to be in control of the ship, and I couldn't control it. is a kind of initiation right. Each of the young crew admits to feeling a slightly different person by the time the ship reaches calmer waters. About a week before we got to Tenerife, the water was beginning to get fairly warm, and we decided that perhaps it was about time that we had our first sea shower. <laughs> In the ship's laboratory, there's a chance to study the marine life of these calmer, warmer waters. The characteristics of a flying fish are recorded. Normal everyday things go through my mind. Uh, I find this fantastic opportunity just to sit back, relax, think little things about family, friends, uh, past experiences, what I want to do in the future. I often think of home and what my family's doing and what I'd be doing with them at the time. But um, I have never been lonely. There's always been somebody there. I mean, there's 36 people who can't escape from the company. The Atlantic lies astern. The first landfall after the crossing is the island of St. Vincent. It was beautiful going into St. Vincent, waking up and looking over your shoulder and seeing land. You can smell the, the difference. You can smell the, the green grass and the leaves and sort of inside you're feeling a little bit of excitement growing. Well, 23, 24 days at sea crossing the Atlantic is a long time not to sight land at all. It was quite a feeling to think that in an hour's time we'd be back on the stable ground. We could have it go for a walk. It was to be some walk. The first objective for one team is the volcano La Soufrière. It's over 3,000 feet to the top. After two and a half hours, they finally reach the rim of the crater. Amid the excitement of making it to the top and the anticipation of descending to the crater lake, there's a general awareness that the volcano is still active. It's really sad. Now the rubber boats carried to the top are inflated and lowered 600 feet down the steep inner walls of the volcano. 
The lake inside the volcano seems to be a forbidden world that knows no clock or calendar. A place where even the wind appears to change direction from moment to moment without apparent reason. You feel anything can happen here at any time and without warning. In their inflatable dinghy, they head for the island recently created by an upwelling of lava. Part of their mission is to try to learn if a fresh full-scale eruption is likely. The lava island is far larger than anyone had previously supposed. You feel as if you are trespassing upon a dead planet where no life belongs or will ever belong again. But there is evidence that life is already colonizing this dead world. Seeds, perhaps blown by the wind or dropped by a bird, have taken root here. The team finds an increase in both water temperature and simmering volcanic activity. Since the previous explosion, plant life and many forms of tiny living creatures have gradually recolonized the island. The plant life is meticulously noted and catalogued for future study. Why, 20 yards in from water's edge. Yep. I then uh, started on the first circumnavigation of the island, taking water temperatures. Uh, to one spot we started to get a bit worried because the temperature suddenly shot up to about 47 degrees C and the whole area was really warm, the air was warm. It was certainly pretty hot, we couldn't put your hands in the water. And uh, we had to make a rapid retreat just in case the, uh, something started to happen to the craft. Just three months later, or a mere second in geological time, La Soufrière erupted again. The crater island where the explorers had walked was obliterated, and St. Vincent was showered with ash. Eye of the Wind continues westward through the Caribbean and arrives at the crossroads of the world, Colon, Panama. The young explorers of Operation Drake are about to go back in time to rediscover history and recreate one of its most significant chapters, Balboa's jungle crossing from Atlantic to Pacific. They leave the brigantine at Colon to be airlifted into a base camp deep in the jungle of Darien. The whole trip down was, was really exciting. We were traveling over jungle, dense jungle that we had read about the coastline, which was just magnificent. And then we came down quite a, a thump. Our landing was supposed to be quite hairy. The, the airstrip is only 440 yards long, and we landed and stopped at 400 yards and got off. And well, right away we were told where our tents were, where we were going to sleep, um, the daily procedure, and it was all fabulous. We didn't have a chance to test the joint. And that was the, probably the best psychology that they've used yet. From the outset, they begin to experience the harsh realities of life in the jungle. Two-week tropical downpour. But eventually, one team sets off to explore the remains of the tragic Scots colony of Darien. It was in 1697 when Scottish settlers came here to Caledonia Bay and built a rampart for protection against the resentful Spaniards who were here first. Fort St. Andrew and the tiny settlement were soon overwhelmed by disease and Spanish attack. The young explorers find the first evidence, a defensive moat. Work begins on clearing. The undergrowth of centuries has to be hacked away. The site is intensely interesting, actually. This is probably the most recent site as far as historical value goes, and as far as size goes, it's the biggest one. Compared to so many sites that I've, you know, seen either being excavated or read about something like that, you know, that people can go on, archaeologists go on for months, some years, before they find something. They get hints about certain areas and they keep going, and here, this is the gold mine. I haven't gone a day yet where I haven't found at least one object. The site yields some of the most important findings of 17th century Scottish pottery. These are the bowls of clay pipes.
There are signs of ancient battles everywhere. Collapsed fortifications are reconstructed by drawings. Part of a musket. A musket ball. Defensive metal spikes. The archaeological investigation is the first since the colony was abandoned in 1700. More than a thousand Scots lost their lives before the survivors sailed back to Europe. The second part of the search is for a Scottish ship believed sunk in the harbour. A team of Operation Drake divers will explore the muddy bottom of Caledonia Bay at one suspected location. on for several weeks. At last the divers bring up material from a wreck buried deep in mud alongside a reef. Though it isn't the ship they were looking for, the explorers begin to realize that this is the most important historical wreck site so far uncovered in Panamanian waters. Definitely the, the tip of the iceberg because it's, it's all around. In 1699 the brandy aboard the resupply ship Olive Branch caught fire and she sank without a trace until now. <laughs> the team share the experience that only archaeologists know, the thrill of making direct contact with another age. A briefing for one of the most hazardous explorations of Operation Drake. George Thurston, former Royal Marine Commando, will lead a crossing of the Isthmus of Panama following the route that Balboa took. Only 11 members will go. Denise Wilson, a secretary from England, is wondering if she will be one of them. After a physical checkup, she's picked. There will be two other girls on the Balboa jungle route. Bye, Rob. See you. Bye. Take care. The group sets out for Akla where Balboa, the Spanish discoverer of the Pacific, made his own base camp. From Akla, they will try to make it on foot through 180 kilometers of jungle. Balboa used the Akla base camp as a place to dismantle his ships on the Atlantic side before hauling the sections through the jungle for reassembly on the Pacific shore. The multinational group sets off to share a test of teamwork on a journey of self-discovery. As they follow the river inland, George Thurston sends back radio reports. Waiting and often chest deep water and thick mud. I didn't expect the water to feel so thick and slimy. And when we were stood, you could feel the water clinging to your skin and to your clothes. It was dreadful. In that sort of water, you wouldn't actually be able to feel anything biting you. It's a horrible thought to think that other uh, creatures are living from your body. Six miles from Akla, another team under Sergeant Mike Christie of the Royal Engineers has been constructing a spectacular aerial walkway, more than a hundred feet above the jungle floor. The treetop crew of Operation Drake will use the network of suspended pathways to make studies of the ecology of the normally inaccessible upper canopy of the rainforest. Among the young explorers helping in the construction is Claire Birchinger, a nurse. The walkways and platforms would enable scientists on the expedition to collect biological samples at different heights. But physical strain and dehydration pose a constant threat to the health of even the strongest men and women. Just before completion of the walkway, Claire is struck down by a viral infection. She must be evacuated. The only way is to carry her back through the jungle. Anna Richards, the Canadian girl who lost her right leg through cancer, has meantime made an incredible six-mile trip through the jungle to the construction site. She's determined to join in the biological study high on the aerial walkway. Comes down to the point there. You can see it at the point from further up. Mm -hmm. There it is down there. Put both hands down here. Okay. The swaying walkway is precarious, even for a strong person with the use of both legs. What? Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Are you okay? Yeah. Anna's determination pays off. 
she's able to make many of the scientific observations on her own, helping to identify some 70 species of vine, tree, flower and fruit to determine the role of birds, insects and even bats in pollinating the canopy. In most difficult conditions, yes. By now, the Balboa Patrol faces trouble, as leader George Thurston reports by radio. Uh, we just don't know at the moment, uh, but things were pretty bad on the way down here, Have today made good 18 kilometers, but no water of any sort found today will stop. It was very hot while we were walking. I was beginning to get really tired at that point. And I was so sweating an awful lot and I just didn't have the water to replace what I was losing. And you knew there was water in your water bottle, but you just couldn't touch it. You just got to leave it there. And your mouth was sticking together. It's a feeling I'll never forget. With mounting concern over the endangered patrol, helicopter teams are dispatched in a rescue mission. The only feasible plan is to hop from village to village and question the natives who may know the most likely places to search above the dense jungle canopy. The helicopter teams are aware that time is running out. In temperatures where the body needs a gallon of water per day to survive, the young explorers have no more than a pint apiece. After 14 days in the jungle, the patrol does not realize that the Pan American Highway is just a few miles from where they are stranded. The patrol is completely hidden beneath the trees. Then, miraculously, the tiny clearing they have made is spotted. A small chopper is sent with crucial supplies, just in time. The whole patrol is exhausted. A few are in a really bad way. The most severe casualties must be evacuated to receive emergency care. Miles Clark of Great Britain sums up the feeling. It was like being lifted out of a nightmare when the, the chopper was actually winching me up. And I tried to make myself take in as much of it as I could while I was going up because I knew that it was something I'd remember all my life. The whole thing faded almost like a dot in the center of a television screen going away and I suddenly found myself in a completely different situation. When I saw that the blanket of jungle that they'd been searching for us in, I started to realize then what a, what a miracle it was that they'd managed to, to find us at all. Four patrol members had to be airlifted out, but the remainder of the team continues on replenished with water and determined to reach their goal. For that final few miles, it still requires two more days of hiking. They finally stumble out onto the Pan American Highway. What, guerrilla style? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've recognized a, a physical and mental limit in myself. I know now that um, I can push myself. I'm much more resilient than I thought I was. For George Thurston, there is the unparalleled satisfaction of having led the patrol through near disaster and out the other end to safety. And for Denise... I didn't realize that I was looking forward so much to, to seeing the Pan American Highway. But when we saw it, it was just the emotion that arose. There were Anne and I, just, there were just tears in our eyes. It was just so good to see the place and realize that we were practically home and dry. Soon, Eye of the Wind was to sail on to new adventures in the Pacific. From Panama, Eye of the Wind carried its next teams of young explorers on into the Pacific, to Cocos Island and to the Galapagos, where Charles Darwin made many of the observations which helped him to form his theories on evolution. The young explorers found the only surviving female of a subspecies of land iguana. They delivered her to the Darwin Research Institute. The next leg of the voyage was a long one to Fiji, where a new group would take over. The islands of Fiji's Lao group had recently been devastated by a hurricane in which 49 people died. On the remote island of Moala, the new teams labored long and hard to rebuild the local school. 
In Fiji, Eye of the Wind received some urgent repairs, and then she sailed on the final Pacific sea leg to Papua New Guinea, just a few hundred miles north of Australia. The landscape is an explorer's nightmare with continuous volcanic mountains and deep valleys that always seem to run the way you're not going. A new contingent from Operation Drake flies in to begin this phase. Among the multinational young explorers are two from the United States. As director of operations, it's my task to brief the newcomers and to put our adventure into perspective, giving them an idea of what previous teams have already accomplished and what they may expect in the very near future. And that was how we came up with Operation Drake. I know that the newspapers will go on saying that we're following the route of Drake. We're not. He didn't have the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal when he was around. And of course, you know, we're going through both of them. The only connection, really, with Drake is, is the anniversary. It is the 400th anniversary since Drake went around the world. And I'm sure you know the story. He went around reduce income tax for Great Britain. That line didn't get much of a laugh. Nor did the weather when I described the normal conditions in Papua New Guinea. The weather was something the team was soon going to meet at first hand. As an example, a jungle expert from the Australian Army instructed the group how to deal with minor injuries, even scratches, that can so easily turn septic under tropical conditions. Rainfall in Papua New Guinea can reach 250 inches per year. The group must learn to put up tents and cope with life in the jungle amid unceasing tropical downfalls. It's time to move out into the bush. The first test is the crossing of a raging river. Bryce Baith of New Zealand attempts to cross alone, using a light rope as a lifeline. Yep, okay. Right, let him have it. The current is much stronger than expected. The main danger is from loose boulders that often cascade downriver. If the rope becomes snagged on a rock, the swimmer can quickly find himself pulled under. heavier rope is attached to the light one and pulled across. Now slowly, inch your way across. Sally Mountford carries her pack loosely on one arm, so she can grip the rope with both hands and ditch the pack quickly if need be. The force of the river is so strong it begins to sweep Sally's pack away. Suddenly she is in danger of being swept away herself. and just barely avoids calamity. Caroline Buxton from Jersey has never even been camping before, much less attempted to cross a wild river. Some require more help than others, but for all, the experience is a reminder that life here has no guarantee from one moment to the next. Another Operation Drake team is flown by the Royal Australian Air Force deep into the unknown Western Highlands, to the headwaters of the Strickland River. There, they'll try to run rapids that have never been charted, let alone boated. The Strickland flows south, descending 12,000 feet in 250 miles to join the Fly River on its way to the Coral Sea. The boating party is dropped above river at Copiago village. Each man is chosen for previous experience. The only young explorer is Yogi Thami, who has done some river running in Nepal. In charge of the Strickland River project is Major Roger Chapman, one of the most experienced whitewater men in the world. And then we'll the group has negotiated with a village leader for native carriers to bring up supplies and equipment. The porters walk barefoot over the sharp rocks. 
The boats themselves will be airdropped to the end of the two-day journey. The party marches through dense jungle. The bush country here is among the least known of the world's remote areas. The carriers use a tribal working chant, a form of communication across the valley from one hilltop to another. The chant is a kind of yodeling call, a warning that strangers are approaching, meaning no harm. At last, near the Strickland River, a government Dakota approaches to airdrop the boats. A sapper staff sergeant guides the pilot in by radio. Hello, Defense Zero Three, this is Three One. Uh, that kit landed within about uh, 30 meters. In the crates are two large inflatable boats. Beautiful. The carriers who can't swim watch with interest as each boat is launched on the uncharted river. The Operation Drake party will have four men in each boat. At this point, the Strickland proves navigable, but that won't last very long. The oldest and most experienced man on the team is Captain Jim Masters from Great Britain. The party is on a section of river that drops 3,000 feet within 70 miles without a single large waterfall. After three days, the Strickland begins to show its real nature. become lined with steep, razor-sharp limestone walls. In places, only 15 feet separate one ledge from another. It's called the Kawiji Crossing, a narrow gorge with raging rapids of such violence that no boats could run them. An exhausting portage is the only way forward. At the end of a morning's carrying, the team is exhausted and hungry. To make matters worse, a storm breaks. A brief rest and a meal, and then the heavy task of lowering the boats by line down the last of the rapids. Okay, let it go. The last big rapids are the worst of all. The boats are set afloat while the team attempts to guide them with ropes from the shore. Each boat contains equipment and supplies for half the party. If one is lost, at least there'll be something left. makes it through. The second boat hits trouble. The rope snags on a rock. Frantically, Jim Masters gives out slack. It works, but all of a sudden, the line attached to the first boat becomes dangerously taut. It's caught further downstream. Helplessly, they watch as the five-ton breaking strain rope snaps. The boat is adrift and is swept away. Chasing it in the narrow gorge would be futile. The eight-man team is stranded some 600 miles from expedition headquarters without the means to continue or to retreat. By sheer luck, a small chopper a few hundred miles away hears their radio call and comes to help search for the lost boat. With Jim Masters aboard, the chopper heads south downstream over the Devil's Race. When he lands, Jim reports to the group. But that's way, way down, and it could have been the single oar that we lost earlier on, you know, when we turned over? Yeah. There's no sign, uh, no evidence at all of the, uh, the boat. I think it's way, you know, so far did you go on, down on. to the Devil's Race? Oh, beyond there. Well, we've got all the notes and all the details of the river, and maybe, you know, someone with a little more luck than us can follow in our path. After a three-day wait without shelter and little food, the men are airlifted off, and the boat is found on a sandbank, a full 15 miles downstream. 
One of the key Pacific battlegrounds in the Second World War was the bush country of New Guinea. In 1942, the Battle of the Coral Sea enabled the Allies to halt the Japanese drive in the Pacific. If Port Moresby had fallen, Australia would have faced certain invasion. Relics from the battle still abound. The young explorers of Operation Drake head for the northeast section of Papua New Guinea, where the Allied armies fought Japanese soldiers in the jungle. A very obvious feature, and we'll see it when we get down to Tamubo. Uh, the mission is this, partly a personal this one. Hill here was, was Green Hill. Clem Graham of Australia seeks to retrace the, the footsteps of his father, who fought here during the war and was wounded at Salamoa. Not With sure. Clem is Colonel Robin Jordan of the Royal Engineers. Oh, yeah, I saw Ridge. He came through, I think, in later 43, and they were, or well, his company were tied up in uh, mopping up, you know, any small Japanese strongholds. So that was after the, the ridges. That was after the capture of Salamo yeah. and, and Lay. Yeah. The downside harder than what we're doing. Zero Bravo. This is three four. We are at Mubo. Mubo. Repeat Mubo. Grid reference on Wow Map. Mubo was the scene of bitter fighting along the Black Cat Trail, still strewn with relics left in the exact positions where they'd been abandoned more than 35 years before. Thank God, he's down here. 45, looks like, yeah. Pistol or something. That's in good nick too, really. They reached Salama, where the Japanese had their base. Clem's father was one of the Australians who came here to finish the battle. But the Japanese kept slipping away through the jungle. Clem, the past suddenly comes to life. Up in the Finisterre mountain range, natives have reported seeing a large wartime aircraft that crashed in the hills. Inaccurate maps often cause pilots to misjudge the mountains by thousands of feet. If you take us today, how long will it take us to get there? So we get, will we get to the plane today? No, no. no. tomorrow morning. Yeah. Did uh, ask Yamoro if he saw any evidence of a man, because it looks as though the pilot parachuted out. So ask him if he's seen any evidence of a man or... No. And this cord Yamoro got out of a tree. Yeah, it was standing on a tree and it got it. Ah, maybe the pilot well, shoot it out. Yeah. We'll have a look when we get up there. Yeah. What else we got? They start out with some of the local people acting as guides. They climb higher and higher and eventually reach 11,000 feet. Some local guides begin to drop out because of the cold. Luckily, some guides stick with it. Without them, finding the lost plane would be a matter of guesswork and sheer luck. Patrol leader, Lieutenant James Horlick of the Coldstream Guards, is the first to reach the crashed plane. That's the end of a wing. Uh, yeah, bits all over the place, you see, yeah. Hey. Hi. In the cold, wet, clammy forest, they search for any human remains. Stuff he must have got out of here. Yeah, that's... Parachute. Yeah. Remnants of a parachute indicate that the pilot probably crashed with the plane. Well, it looks like our friend the pilot didn't get very far, didn't it? It's in English, so it's uh, going to be an American plane. Yeah. And it uh, looks like inspection hole. Hole or something, yeah. Did on this yeah. hole or add any other. So, oh. yeah. This is tired, James. Come on, have a look. Yeah. See what we can find on it. Yeah, it's a bit of a the raking. I mean, it's great away. It's got a big tire, isn't it? General Tire and Rubber Company. 
There is no sign of the remains of the crew. After the crash, survivors probably stumbled off into the jungle and died here on the mountain. Hey, hey, what's this? It's a signal pistol. American type. One or two inch. There you are, you can see it in the barrel. That could be cleaned up. True. Discovery of the plane's serial number is the most important find. Perhaps, at long last, the facts can be put together. A husband, a father, a brother, missing in action since World War II, can finally be put to rest. A-0. 6477A. So we've got four engine, which gives us a heavy bomber, which big, big fine, yeah. But it must presumably be a B-17, don't we think? And B-17s are certainly obeyed. Yeah. Uh, that's right, yeah. It's, uh, it's American. It's got a blue painted undercarriage and just yeah, a, it's quite a interesting greeny scene. brown. Uh, major wreckage for 50 metres that way and there's more stuff, uh, you know, another 50. So that's 100, 100 odd metres that way. And it's come in here and this is about 10 or 11,000 feet. It's near the top of the range. Yeah, near the top of this 12,000 foot hill. And uh, it's just clipped this... I reckon he's just, just clipped this ridge here through the cloud or something and just... And he's, it looks as though he's been loaded with bombs. Attempts will be made to trace the plane's history, to find the identities of pilots and crew, and even if possible, to contact surviving relatives. All war relics will be presented to the Papua New Guinea government, and United States authorities will be given all the details of the plane. Continuous aerial bombardment of the Japanese occurred in Rabaul Harbor, off an island near the northeast tip of Papua New Guinea. Carrier-based American planes annihilated the Japanese fleet, sending some 40 ships to the bottom. Some of this black and white wartime film is used to pinpoint wrecks in the harbor. Or just RAF diver Dave Whitehall sweeps Clem before making the first dive. The first find, the coral encrusted bows of a once proud warship. recognizable anchor. The skull and bones of a Japanese sailor. Clem carefully puts the bones back in place, out of respect for the dead sailor. A scarcely recognizable naval gun. Another dive in a shallow part of the harbor reveals an astonishing sight. A tank so remarkably preserved that it almost seems to be waiting to go into battle. It must have been prematurely driven off a landing craft under the stress of a bombing raid. While Operation Drake's divers explore the seabed battlefield of Rabaul Harbor, another team sails to nearby Masingaro on a quest to find a legendary dragon. Over the years, eyewitness reports have told of a giant creature in Papua New Guinea, sometimes called a tree crocodile. Its local name, apparently, is Artrilia. It's even been described as a dinosaur-like animal up to 50 feet in length. The local people say it breathes fire, can stand on its hind legs, hunts at night, and has been known to kill human beings. Can you, can you, does anyone know what it sounds like when it, when it whistles? 
The search begins. In a swamp, the team spots a large footprint. Disappointingly, it's identified as that of a cassowary, a relative of the emu. The party presses on to the next village, where one man claims to have met the monster face to face. I shot it, but he started to yeah, run away. Yeah. Yeah. What have you Price found? Bryce from New Zealand asks for more details. Yeah, found a lizard. Really? You found a lizard? Yeah. Yeah? How big? I think 10 feet long. Good. Good. Great. Well, that sounds promising indeed. Right. They move on to the exact spot where the creature was last reported. Hides are set up. Groups will watch in shifts for two months if necessary. For Bryce, one day merges into another. First sighting proves to be a false alarm. They are monitor lizards, all right, but nothing out of the ordinary in size or appearance. The monitors can at least stand up on their hind legs the way the mysterious dragon is said to do. But Bryce and his companions are convinced the villagers have seen something far more dramatic. The weeks of watching go by. Then one day, something very different enters the clearing tempted by the deer carcass laid down as bait. This giant lizard is eight feet long and its coloration is different from the far smaller monitors seen so far. It's the nearest thing in size to the famous Komodo dragon, the giant monitor of Indonesia. The sharp, powerful claws are just like those in the stories of the legendary monster Artrilia. But the tail is much thicker than the ones the local people usually describe. The giant lizard, Artrilia, certainly does exist. It turned out to be Salvador's monitor, and one six-foot baby specimen was obtained later. Now the various teams from Papua New Guinea converge on the lower waters of the Strickland River. Each group has accomplished a different task, including crocodile counts and carrying out medical checks in jungle villages for the government. At the river's mouth, they rejoin Eye of the Wind. Never again in their lives are they likely to have so much experience of this very special kind. Roger Chapman, leader of the Strickland River Whitewater team, makes a special presentation. Services rendered on the mighty Strickland. Miss Strickland, 1979. Yeah. To Sally Mountford of New Zealand goes the honour of wearing the good luck garter the explorers have carried with them throughout the trip. Eye of the Wind sails from Papua New Guinea on the final leg of her round the world voyage. After an expedition in the remote island of Sulawesi, she crosses the Indian Ocean for Kenya. East and southern Africa have few ruins. Those of the mysterious city of Zimbabwe are the most famous. But in northern Kenya, close to the Islamic port of Lamu, there was a group of cities that 500 years ago traded with Arabia and even China. Beneath the thick bush, the team uncover evidence of one of the first ports in the region. Their work reveals tombs and even mosques. In Kenya's Abadir National Park, another team under the direction of a Royal Engineer officer rebuilds a 300-foot timber walkway for game viewing at the Ark Game Lodge. Other teams survey a little explored volcano and make a 300-mile camel trek around the shores of Lake Turkana. At last, Eye of the Wind heads homeward, round the Horn of Africa, 
through the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. The Bay of Biscay characteristically obliges with a final storm. December the 13th, she passes triumphantly under Tower Bridge. What can possibly follow or exceed Operation Drake? Well, now on the drawing board is an even more ambitious project. It's called Operation Rally. <laughs> 